Before we get started, I have a special request. If you're on camp and in the possession of a steel brush for cleaning grills, please join us at the 2342 Village next to the Hack Center at 8 p.m. and you'll be eligible for some delicious steak. First one to show up uh, wins. Um, now a quick learning opportunity before we get started. Um, so don't put dates in the titles of your talk proposals during a pandemic because, you know, the events might not happen. So, um, yeah. Let's get started. Um, I think the title gives it away pretty well. Um, I'm up here tonight to show you how to build modern and robust web applications without writing any JavaScript. Um, apparently, that's a topic of interest here. So first things first, um, JavaScript has merit. Um, it's not like I'm bashing on JavaScript or anything. Um, I'm also not saying JavaScript is terrible. I'm also not saying JavaScript code is inherently bad, but I'm saying I don't like to use a second or a third language when I'm programming or solving business problems. So yeah, the thing is, it uses JavaScript, but we're not going to write any of it. So everything is already done. We don't have to take care of it, and we won't notice it's there. Um, the talk structure, um, really quick, I'm going to start with three questions for the audience, uh, introduce myself and tell you why I'm here, um, or at least what qualifies me, and um, how you can avoid huge pain. Then we'll continue with a practical example and some semi-live coding. And well, the last part is going to be a REST controller for um, the set project we're about to do. And um, I'm going to have an offstage Q&A. Um, afterwards because probably the, I'm going to run out of time. So yeah, I'm, we're going to do it outside somewhere. Um, some more things up front. Um, you won't learn a new programming language today. Um, the syntax is pretty easy um, to understand. If you're if you know proficient in English, then you probably understand everything we're about to do. Um, but you will get the interest in learning a new language that much, I can promise you, or at least I hope. Um, because you can achieve so much with just so little, as you will just witness. And the syntax, um, really, if you're proficient um, with Ruby, then you'll just probably understand most of it right away. If you have questions, um, please write them down or remember them until the end of the talk. As said, um, there might be, uh, well, there, there will be the Q&A outside the tent. Um, but yeah, just keep it until the end, please. Thank you. Um, so, a little audience participation. Who here has uh, written a web application just by a show of hands? All right, that's about everyone. Um, who opted for a refresh rather than updating the DOM or writing JavaScript? I'd say, well, all right, good. Um, how many of you wished have, not having written JavaScript or having to debug it? All right, three quarters, I guess. Um, all right, so why am I here and who am I? I'm Franz, I'm 37. I work as a freelance IT consultant for almost 20 years now. Um, I'm located in Nuremberg, Germany. I'm a certified um, something and doesn't really matter. I got my swinging badge too. Um, I've consulted for multiple Fortune 500s and US stock listed companies and done paid projects in over 25 languages which usually means more than the typical hello world. People don't pay for that. Um, it's more about 30 now. I stopped counting at the last talk I gave like seven years ago. So who knows? Um, I've been building distributed backends for quite a while now. I started out with Scala. Um, I'm a Lyft web committer still to this day, even though I don't do anything anymore. But you know, um, anyone remembers Foursquare, uh, the check-in app? Yeah, that's built on with Lyft web. So you've used my code. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, then I got heavily into Golang um, when I got sick of the JVM and learning its special intricacies over the years. Um, yeah, and then I moved on to Elixir slash Erlang in 2019. Meet the Phoenix Elixir framework. That's at least how you avoid the huge pain part. It's written in Elixir. How many of you know the language Elixir? 
All right, so four people, that's fair. All right. Um, it uses the Erlang VM at least, so it feels like Ruby to a degree. So if anyone has tried Erlang and not gotten along with the syntax, I urge you to try Elixir. Um, Erlang is really, really good at message parsing. Not parsing, but parsing and pattern matching. So um, Elixir is too. And it's really good at handling huge numbers of connections. So if you're doing web projects and you need to scale out later, then it's a lot easier doing it this way. It comes with a built-in distributed pub sub, so you can do fancy stuff. Um, if you have an Erlang cluster or you decide to scale it up into a cluster, then you automatically get a distributed fault tolerant pub sub. I mean, that's great. And it's a functional language. The, well, Elixir itself, and the whole thing is event-driven, so yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome in, in any, any regards, because it abstracts away anything you do with JavaScript, really. I haven't written a line of JavaScript in almost two and a half years, so I'm happy about that. And it comes with out-of-the-box WebSocket transport and AJAX fallback, so you don't really take care of any of the fallback measurements or implement yourself anything, it just goes itself. And yeah, it falls back to get post request if JavaScript is disabled. So if you, you know, one of those guys that wants to disable JavaScript, most of the stuff is still gonna work, except for some minor things that we'll go about later. And we are going to talk specifically about the feature called Live View. And it's server side rendered HTML. Well, most of the HTML is. And but the difference is through this, the server always knows which variable is bound where in the DOM. So, you know, you can easily update it without you actually having to know it. And then it sends diffs to the browser over WebSockets or AJAX, so your web page gets updated, but not, you know, the entire page or anything, just the snippets that change. That's pretty efficient. And people already wrote browser games with it, like 60 plus FPS. I mean, impressive for something like that. <coughs> so, the thing I like about it is I can really just write business logic and not solve all the other problems that have to do with whatever happens between the browser and my server, that all of that is taken care of. So you can really just focus on whatever you want to build. And I think that you know, makes for a lot of fun and gets back to actually solving problems and not you know, <laughs> solving problems to solve another problem and then solve another problem. So you're actually working at the, the things you want to solve. And you don't have to care or think about when event X happens, I have to update element XYZ in the DOM. So, and when it's disabled, well, I don't have, you know, we don't have to write the fallback ourselves. I mean, by now, I mean, how many implementations are there out there? So we shouldn't have to write this on every other web page ourselves. How does the whole thing work? So, as I said, first it delivers a rendered HTML, as every web server usually does. Um, guarantees that most stuff works, even when JavaScript is turned off, but if JavaScript is enabled, then the WebSocket connection takes over. And it ensures that it automatically re-renders and updates all the right parts of the web page, which is nice, because we don't have to do it. And if JavaScript is disabled, well, then everything except the real-time streaming updates and stuff like that is going to not work. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> so the server knows all the places it renders variables, so it knows which parts to update. Uh, this is a pretty easy example. I don't know if you can see it from back there, or, but generally speaking, you have you know a snippet, and it replaces a variable, so your server side should know that there is something that could be updated. That's the easy code part, but we're going to explore it in the, in the live coding in a second. So the simple demo project I prepared is um, a web-based thermostat that is going to li be live updating. Um, why? Because it's in the Web Frameworks um, documentation. So should you decide to learn more about it, you'll know at least some of the bits that you'll read about in the documentation and can relate to it. And it's, it, will, it won't be super foreign to you. So at least you've heard that. And <clears throat> I decided to add pops up to it so I can show off the liveliness and how easy it is to implement. Um, so we're going to create a new project in a second. Um, we're going to add a database model and a migration for persistence. 
Um, we're going to add two buttons to increase and decrease, temper decrease temperature and write 40 lines of code in total um, and add a couple of tests for the new buttons. Yeah, that's terrible. That's super terrible. <laughs> so we're basically now creating a new project and Pardon me? Ah, there are screens. Awesome. All right, so what it's doing now, we're basically creating a new project, and it's downloading all the dependencies and compiling all those. Um, Mix is basically um, Elixir's you know, gem or make or combination of both. And so, yeah, it does a lot of things in the Elixir world. Um, so now it's compiling. This is actually the longest step uh, in the whole, well, where I have to wait for it. The font size. That is really bad right now. <laughs> Pardon me? Is that right? Yeah. All right. So it done, you know, creating the project. I mean, the half of it is going to be on the browser side. Um, so on the right side, so we're going to see it. Um, we're creating the database right now, and all it we're basically doing is um, I'm just removing a warning that's um, coming from uh, the new compiler version that I'm using. And what we're going to do is um, basically create the database, um, start a new server, and look how the how a basic uh, Elixir Phoenix project looks like. That's happening right now. I hope the browser, yeah, that's good. All right. I hope that's clearly visible for everyone. That's basically how a standard Elixir project looks like. So what we're going to do now is um, use a generator, um, to a crop generator, to generate uh, a context called measurements and uh, an, a mo database model called thermostat. Um, it has a name and a temperature. And yeah, so we're going to inspect the model um, in a second. Yeah. So up there, um, yeah, we have our uh, table, our fields, and we're going to set the temperature to default zero. And we're going to remove the validation, uh, the requirement for the temperature, um, just so we have a nice project to work with. Next, we're going to look at the database abstraction. Um, this is basically holding all your database functions, your listers, getter, create, update functions, everything that you need to interact with the database. <coughs> And now we're basically adding the um, CRUD-generated um, UI for the thermostats um, to our router. Um, this is a basic router that comes with the, with the project. Um, pipelines are basically what, what you want to do on, you know, uh, set accept encoding headers and stuff like that, and fetch sessions, stuff like that. Now we're adding the routes for the index page and the uh, show page, and starting up the web server, I think. No, ah, well, we're migrating the database first, of course, because otherwise there's nothing to show. All right. Um, oh, also, we have tests for everything that we generate. So all the getters, setters, everything that you just saw in the uh, database abstraction gets um, generated tests by default. Um, so you have something to go off, and yeah, you don't have to write everything ourselves. Um, yeah. Running the test suite, Elixir comes with different, or well, Phoenix um, comes with different environments. So we have the development environment, the test environment, and the production environment. Each of these could or can have different dependencies. So it has different builds for all these environments. That's why it's recompiling again for the test environment. Should be done in a second. <clears throat> All right, so all of our tests have passed. It already has 17 tests that we have automatically generated. So now we're going to start the server and look at the thermostat CRUD, that we, oh, well, the, the, the stuff that we just generated. We're going to create a new thermostat named MCH 2022. And it has a standard you know, edit forms, um, delete, and um, also show stuff that you know, comes with normal CRUD operations. And what we're going to do now is basically just tweak the template that we're seeing on the right. And we're going to add a couple of things to it to yeah, 
make you see why we're here. Um, first, we're committing the project, because at the end, I'm going to show you a little nice gimmick about testing. And yeah. So. All right, we're now editing basically the template that we're seeing on the right. And what we're about to do is basically just add a little um, element around the temperature so we can later test on it uh, a little bit easier. So basically, I'm just adding an, a span with an ID temperature around it so I can reference it later directly. Um, now, I'm just adding two buttons uh, that we need to increase and decrease the temperature. The good thing about it is the ID attribute is not really needed for the function of it. It's just needed so later when we're writing a test for it that we can reference that button more easily. So we just copy the button to just yeah, make the decrease function as well. <coughs> All right, our buttons are showing. Great. And now we're just, you know, adding the business logic behind those buttons. This is a fairly standard um, Elixir controller. And um, basically at the top, um, you have the alias for our context, for our database context. And um, now we're adding um, that we're, on, well, basically we're getting the thermostat that has been passed as an ID. And then we're checking if the socket or the web browser that's connected is connected through a live socket, or at least, you know, web socket or um, AJAX fallback. And then we're doing a pub sub subscribe um, to a topic which is a thermostat um, and the ID. That's about it for, for that part. Next, we <clears throat> next we're going to implement the, the actual handling of the button. So a function called handle event and the decrement um, that we have specified on the PHX click attribute of the button we added before. Next, altering the temperature and then calling the update function that we're about to implement in a second. Copy that part over. All right. So now we have a function for incrementing, decrementing, and um, now we just need our update function that doesn't come out of nowhere. So um, you could technically, in case you're wondering, do pattern matching on um, function arguments. Um, would look like something like um, you know you're specifying with a um, percent sign, and then your your class or the object you're trying to to use would look something like that. In case you're wondering, I did a coding error there during the recording of the screencast, so um, yeah, I had to use that creatively. Um, yeah, so basically we're now having our write function with first argument being the socket, the second one being the temperature, and thermostat um, now getting updated in the database um, with the temperature that we are passing in. And last but not least, um, we're going to send it through PubSub because, you know, when we're updating, we actually want the other clients that are watching that page to get the updated version. And so we are broadcasting to our PubSub in the topic for thermostat um, with the ID. And then we send a custom payload, which is a tuple of updated, which is an atom, and um, our updated thermostat. And I think, uh, yeah, now we're basically just assigning the updated uh, thermostat to our web page. And that's actually all the magic that's required to update anything in Phoenix Live View. So you update just the variables that you want to update, and Phoenix takes care of this. So last but not least, we need a function that actually handles um, the PubSub broadcast or receives it. So we're going to pattern match here on our tuple, which is uh, updated, and the thermostat. Last argument is the socket. 
And we're basically just doing the same as we did in the function before, um, and just when that event happens, update variable thermostat in our web page. Um, that's all it takes. And now we're going to try it out. Oops, there's a warning. So it, Elixir in the current versions tells you that you have unused variables. Um, in this case, I left it in by, you know, to show off that you already learn stuff or find out stuff by just compiling your, your code with the newer compilers. And yeah. Now we start the server. And we click plus and you know updates the database to the left you see the orange lines that do the actual changes in the database or debug them. Now we are just opening a second browser and see that this is not just you know, some goofy so you see on the left on the right the, the temperature goes up and down. That's pretty much uh, as live as it gets. Anyone noticed we haven't written any JavaScript yet? So um, this is not all. So for the last part of this, um, I'm going to write a test to actually test the functionality we just implemented so we can make sure that this always works, which is actually pretty nice in terms of you can deliver source code that is thoroughly tested. So these are all the functions uh, or the tests for the functions that we just previously witnessed in, in the CRUD UI, all the in listing, indexes, editing, all that stuff. And now we're adding a test uh, basically just for um, incrementing or increasing, decreasing the thermostat temperature. Just stealing a couple of lines there. So <coughs> basically what we're doing is now we're asserting that the standard temperature that is shown on that web page is 42 degrees, which is the default value from our fixture. Next, we are actually triggering or clicking the increase button. And that's why I added the ID, so I can just easily reference that button here. Um, use the render click function and yeah, test at the end if it's 43 now. Copy that test over and basically write a test for the decrease function. Should be 42 then. And I think we're done with the test suite. Well, all our tests are passing, so we wrote something that works and that's manageable, uh, testable, and reproducible. Um, last but not least, I want to share a little, well, not secret, but some fun, well, interesting in, in that regard. We're now going to add Git hooks into our um, mix configuration, um, which is basically going to ensure that on every commit, it's going to run a series of commands. And if any of those commands are failing, then the commit won't happen. So you're going to have to debug or you know, do some stuff in order to get the commit through. Um, what we are actually doing here is setting a pre-commit hook um, to do two things. Uh, one of the things is um, we're checking if all the code is formatted. So mix comes with a format checker. There's a configuration file you can change all the code styling things you want to change um, and ensure code quality. So, and at the end, it's basically taking care of that. So the first command is that in the tasks that we're running is mix test minus minus check minus formatted. And the second one is just going to be a mix test command to run our test suite before, of course, every commit. You could set whatever commit hook if you want, you know, pre-push or whatever there is, you can just do that there. Now we're getting the dependency that we just added. Added, Jesus. Install the hook, and we're off to commit um, our changes, which will fail because we didn't format our code. So. Now let's format it, rerun that command again, and suddenly everything will be committing to Git. All right. 
Um, but it's not all unicorns and rainbows. Um, so there are some drawdowns with Elixir and, and Erlang. So um, the garbage collection isn't as, how do you say it, um, efficient as other languages. So um, be careful what you put into the garbage bin, is all I'm going to say. Um, well, actually, the best example is if you're updating something, a counter on a web page, and you're hammering at high rates uh, a structure with 30 fields through the pub sub, and while you're just interested in one integer, then you know, use a tuple or something that will be more efficient than you know, hitting on the garbage collector. Um, another thing is Erlang variables are immutable. I mean, given in in other languages, um, I, I've known the concept, but it can be really hard to, to get back to that. Um, in Elixir, happily, you can reassign variables. So your structures are all immutable, but you can reassign variables. Um, the whole thing has, well, this is not actually a bad thing, but it's a learning curve. And you have to let, learn to re enum reduce or enum map efficiently if you're using it. But it's not that bad. Um, so the last example is going to be, or for the live coding part, um, adding a REST controller. Um, in under 30 lines of code, live updating the template that we just saw in the browser, and we're doing it with curl. So you could do it from an Arduino or you know whatever you want to have there. Just a simple HTTP client is enough, and the thing will show off pattern matching with HTTP requests. All right, now we are going back into our router, adding or well, uncommenting the API endpoint, and we're going to add um, a route for a get request on slash API slash, slash thermostat slash um, ID, and then the call either increase or decrease. Now we're writing a new well, controller for, for Elixir. This is basically the other half to live view. This is basically a standard controller which Phoenix supports without problems. So you can, if you're used to MVC or anything like that, and you can just use that model, um, but it won't have all the goodies that live view does. So now we're basically just writing the basic um, controller and the function thermostat that we specified in our router. The first parameter is the ID address, uh, the ID, sorry. And the second one is going to be a call. Uh, if, if you look closely, you can see the second parameter, the call parameter, is actually not um, matching to a variable, but to a specific string. So you can mix and match, basically. So if you want one parameter, but the other one has to be something specific, you can actually pattern match on that. So what we're doing now is basically, it, it's the same thing we did before on the live view side. It's basically getting the thermostat out of the database. Um, increasing the temperature and calling an update function onto that thermostat. Copy that over, make it you know, the opposite function of it. And now we have the decrement function. Last but not least, the update thermostat function, which is also almost the same as before. Um, updating the database. Um, so we call measurements.update thermostat, first parameter of thermostat, second the, para the, the fields you want to change. And once that comes back, you just you know, broadcast it on the pub sub, as we did before, on our thermostat ID topic. Payload is the same as before. Um, atom of updated and the thermostat we got back from the database. And that's about it. So let's try that out. So we're curling the endpoint for you know, decrement, decrement, increment, increment, and it's you know live updating the, the website. And we're doing that with curl and no dodgy refresh or anything. 
So the last thing is we are also going to write a test for this functionality just to show off that it's also not much more complicated than it was with the live view. So basically defining our REST um, controller module, aliasing our database um, context called measurements, and importing the fixture functions that um, we generated automatically while the, just, uh, the tests were generated. Now we write the test for slash get, uh, the, the test for get slash API thermostat ID and either increment and decrement. We get passed into our tests a connection, which you can then, you know, if, if you work with the test suite a bit more, um, you can do a lot of things there. So the first assertion in terms of testing is going to be if the temperature is, again, 42, which is the default temperature. Um, now we're going to test the increment um, of the temperature. So get uh, for slash API thermostat, the variable for the thermostat ID and increment. We assert that we got a 200 HTTP response and then we are getting that thermostat from the database freshly, so we can test if the temperature went up. Copy that over for the decrement function and just you know swap the corresponding values. So the URL for decrementing is the correct one and testing for the 42 temperature. That's about it. So <clears throat> now we run our test suite. Well, actually we're committing, so that's the same thing. Now it's the same, <laughs> same thing. So our formatting test went through, testing the code went through, everything is fine. So we've implemented all of the things we want to implement in really a short amount of time. And we tested all of them, so you know you can deliver products, or at least you know you have code that works, and not just you know you tested it once after you coded it and stuff like that. If you want to learn more about Phoenix or the framework or Elixir Lang, um, the URLs are pretty easy. Elixir-lang.org um, is for the language itself. PhoenixFramework.org is the URL for the web framework itself. Um, HexPM is like you know, Elixir's package manager, so like Gem for Ruby. So you can look, go there and look for, you know, libraries that you want to use in your software. And there's also hexdocs.pm, which is basically for every package that gets published on hexpm, there is documentation automatically generated, published, everything there right for you to consume. So uh, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope something stuck. Find me on Twitter. Um, if you want to look at the code again, because you couldn't read it on the screen, then um, check out my GitHub. And visit us at the 22, uh, 20, 2342 Village. Um, right next to the Hack Center, we have Franconian beer, um, if anyone is interested. And we're not trying to take anything of it home with us. So if uh, we could get some support in clearing that out, that would be great. All right. Um, the Q and I will be on that exit. Outside of that, wait. Uh, we have plenty of time. You we have. Through All right. The, uh, uh, presentation so much that we can actually do a Q and A right now and right here. Awesome. Then let's do it here. Which is great because this will result that the Q and A is also on the stream and the That's great. Which That's is great. great. So if you have any questions, please come to these microphones in here and uh, please uh, ask away. Uh, Signal Angel, do we have something from the internet? Thank you. Seems like me. <laughs> yeah, I learned something. Get closer, yes. Uh, learned something new. Uh, the, my constructive critic is the rushing through the code was a little bit too fast to see the details. And I would have needed some yes, syntax ideas, what uh, interpunctions mean, so I can follow a little bit more but definitely worth to look into it. 
Well, the idea wasn't to actually teach you a language, it was to show you how efficient that framework is. So you I actually just wanted to tease you to either you're interested in the efficiency, then le learn the language and the concepts, or you know, if, if that's nothing for you, then don't look further, but it's also hard to stuff so many information. Yeah. Or, you know, if, if I would have just added one more module or, or show off, then you know, it's hard to time then. Yeah. See. Thank you. Uh, we do have two microphones. You may line up behind them, and I would then call you out one after the other. Please, go ahead. Yeah, question. Um, how hard would it be to integrate user management and probably even single sign-on with a Microsoft AD? Thank you for this great question. Um, that's absolutely not, not an issue. There are a couple of open ID connect um, connectors or uh, packages that you can use. Um, they're pretty easy to implement and you, basically you're just implementing about like let's say 30 lines of actual code for the redirect once you know you come back from the single sign on. So you're actually just implementing the parts that matter in those regards and not reinventing the wheel of how single sign on works. So you're probably done in about one or two hours if you're a first time user. Um, if you're seasoned one, then let's say 15 minutes. Um, then you have single sign on. Uh, user management depends. If you want single sign on, then you don't need technical big user management in there. Um, if you want to implement it yourself, um, use a CRUD generator and add the functionality around it, let's say an hour or two. Yeah. So not very hard to summarize. Not very hard, no. Very good. Thank you for the question. Please continue. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, very uh, uh, inspiring. Uh, but I was wondering, can I also write my business logic in Erlang? You probably can. And how easy I, I, I did be? it. I mean, okay. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what the update cycle is looking for the. Um, Can you please get closer and, to the microphone? Sorry. Yeah. The update cycle for Live View and the Phoenix framework. Like, if there's a new version, how much pain would it be to implement that? Um, I haven't had much pain in. So they're pretty good with backwards compatibility. So, but if you're using something of the new features, then of course you will have to adapt code. But. I haven't come across that much that changed in terms of if you're using the MVC part, everything stayed the same for you know the couple past couple of years. So um, that didn't change much. Um, Live view is the concept I just talked about is like two years old now. Um, I got started when you know version 0.2.1 <laughs> was out, so pretty early or something like that, really really early. And I liked it that much, but. You know, if you want to port over code, then you know you're going to have to port over some code to, to, to match the new requirements. But in terms of backwards compatibility, I don't think you have to worry about that your code won't run in a year or two in terms of just because you're updating. Thank you. Awesome. Just to let you know, we have still about 15 minutes left uh, in the regular slot. So uh, I would think, as opposed to the way we usually do it, uh, we can allow extended questions. Awesome. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, is there any cool tools that you would advise for in your editor? I see you use Vim for uh, both Elixir and uh, Phoenix framework. I mean, I've been a Vim user for, you know, since I'm 12 years old. So um, sometimes uh, if, yeah, it, I've heard people have good experiences with VS Code. No, but I mean any tooling that you use in Vim, like any plugins that you would advise for Phoenix Framework or Elixir? Um, there's just a plugin, I think. Uh, I'm using it with, I don't know, I configured it two years ago, it just works. <laughs> Wasn't much magic to it. Um, so there's just like a Vim plugin, and use that, and it has everything you need. Yeah, it's also specific for Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, Elixir. It's, it's Elixir. Okay. Uh, All right, thanks. Thanks, awesome. Next one, please, go ahead. Yeah, I thought I could ask only one question. So. <laughs> no, if you, <laughs> if you like to keep more distance between you, you may also use the other microphone in the back. I will equally switch between them. Uh, I was wondering, what is the underlying database? Uh, that was PostgreSQL, which is the default for all uh, Phoenix projects. So, um, but when you're generating the new project, I think you can just specify which database driver you want to use, and then everything gets generated for most of the common databases, uh, SQLite, uh, MySQL, um, whatever you have there. Not Amnesia. Um, I haven't specifically looked. <laughs> yeah, because that's not okay. 
Because that's not a SQL, that's the, the, the Erlang built-in kind of database. Yeah, but, but we are basically using Ecto. Uh, Phoenix is actually using the Ecto um, SQL uh, object relational management system. So um, I don't think it comes with Amnesia um, support. I could be wrong. I haven't checked. But um, I mean, people have implemented other key value stores and stuff like that uh, as you know, an adapter for, for Ecto, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's really an adapter for it. So. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, <laughs> Hello again. Hello again. Uh, how big is the code that gets sent to the client, the initial uh, libraries that gets loaded? Um, they're actually pretty small if you're not, you know, you can work with the JavaScript part of it. You can inject your own stuff, no problem at all. Um, so it gets bigger, of course, but the standard stuff is rather small. I haven't, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, um, but it's, it loads in seconds and there's no bloat in it. So it's really just the underlying um, live view JavaScript and, and a couple of other, um, I think the top bar thing. So you, you see when the web page is actually reloading and stuff like that. but. Um, to my knowledge, that's pretty insignificant in terms of loading size. Like, like 200 kilobytes, maybe? Or is that Probably way? less, even. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised. Good. Thank you. Less than 30. OK. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Please, the back microphone now. Yeah, oh. sounds about small. Um, hello again, too. Any, uh, hello again. <laughs> are there any <laughs> other web controls or bootstraps you can include, and how do you work on the JavaScript part? If um, you want to. There's an app.js file in the project. You can just you know, go ahead and work with that, but you don't need to. That's the whole thing of the talk. Um, doesn't mean you can't or you shouldn't, but you don't have to if you don't want to. So um, yeah. And using any other web controls, I mean, like Telerik? Whatever yeah, Tailwind is uh, easily available as a gem, uh, as, a, as a hex package, so you can just you know, reference it. There's a pretty awesome tutorial on it. Um, you, you have to just Google for it for Phoenix Framework Tailwind, um, and you will step on it. That's probably the first hit on Google. Okay. Very good. So the front microphone, please. Uh, you used PubShop. Uh, do you recommend it for large projects? I heard that it can be too limiting. Uh, are there other messaging uh, ways to, is it included? Yeah, it's basic, yeah. it comes with a distributed PubSub. The thing I like about it, if you're using the PubSub stuff, you can just cluster or scale up your installation. So, so whatever your project may be and you need more instances or whatever, you can just cluster and that PubSub stuff basically you know, takes care of, you know, I need to reach all of the nodes because you're basically having just a big pub sub cluster. So yeah, I mean, if, you, if there are really a lot of messages going on, um, are there alternatives to pub sub, or do you not recommend that? Uh, I haven't seen a single person actually doing any alternatives to it. Okay. Um, I wouldn't advise using an alternative, but you, you have free to try. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, do we have a question from the internet in the meantime, Signal Angel? That is not the case. In this case, I would like you to give a round of loud applause for France. Thanks. <laughs>